Amen, amen, amen. Um, just to give you a tiny little outline for this message today, because this is one that's going to take some weird turns. So I just kind of want you to know basically where this thing is headed. I am going to give us an intro of the book because Acts is 28 chapters long, okay? So we're gonna try to preach through the entire book of Acts as a church, but we're gonna do it in three parts. Um, we're gonna do eight of those chapters in this first part is our plan. Then we're gonna take a break, do some other preaching series so that we look at some other different topics. Then we're gonna come back in the summer. We're gonna do part two. And then we're gonna take another break again. And then next winter, we'll do part three and we'll finish out the book. At least that's our plan right now. We'll see what the Lord actually has for us. So we're gonna break this thing up. Um, but there's a lot going on in the book of Acts that I want you to understand so that the verses, you, you get some context about it. So we're gonna, we're gonna intro the book. I'm gonna give you that context. Then we're gonna read through a lot of chapter one together. And then there's this tiny little verse at the end. And I'm gonna spend the whole rest of the message just trying to explain that crazy thing. Um, are you ready? Okay, let's go. Um, Acts chapter one, verse one. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. So right away, there's things going on that we don't fully understand. He says, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus. Who in the world is speaking here? Luke, Dr. Luke. The beloved Dr. Luke is the one who is writing this book and he references his first book. So we're not in his first book, right? What's his first book? Luke. <laughs> so, so you've got the gospels of Jesus Christ, which is the description of everything that Jesus said and did in his life captured for us in the beginning of the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You got four of those different gospels. Luke wrote the first one. And when Luke wrote his gospels, he actually wrote it as two different volumes in a set. And it's scroll number one was the gospel of Luke. Scroll number two would have been the Acts of the Apostles. Those titles actually came later, but that's what he was writing. Why? Because this person, Theophilus, asked him to. Theophilus, who's he? We don't actually know. But we know that in the beginning of Luke, he addresses Theophilus there, and he calls him most excellent Theophilus. And that phrase in the Greek is something that Luke uses multiple times. And every other place that he uses it, it's because he is addressing an official Roman um, uh, leader. And so it's a, it's a title of respect and of honor for somebody who's in office. So we believe that Theophilus was likely a wealthy Roman official. He's probably somebody who was in the city of Antioch where Paul had become uh, really a very uh, powerful and popular preacher before he became a missionary. Um, when Paul went to go on his missionary journeys, which we're going to study in the second half of Acts, Theophilus was likely a person in the church that wanted everything that was going on captured. He wanted the history written. And so he paid Luke money. He, he might have even been a wealthy donor who helped Paul take his journeys in the first place. But he paid Dr. Luke to go on the missionary journeys with Paul and to interview everybody he could possibly interview about what had gone on. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that the people at that time knew they were making history. Okay, this isn't something that dawned on everybody decades or even centuries later. It's like, oh my gosh, this guy Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe a big thing happened. It's like, no, they knew in the middle of it, that every church that's being planted and the miracles that are being done, this is a massive moment in human history. We've got to write down everything. And so they, they transcribe it like a history. And Luke is, is uh, just some other things for you to know. Um, he's an educated doctor. So he's very detailed 
Um, he knows technical terms. He understands culture. He understands language. Luke understands geography. He, he's going to give you an amazing amount of detail, and he's highly organized in the way that he writes. Even academics who are not Christian tend to respect Dr. Luke as an ancient historian in his own right because he's so good at what he does. Luke also didn't just write his gospel and the book of Acts right after it all happened. He had time to reflect and had time to interview additional people. One of the things you might notice every Christmas is that when we read about the shepherds and Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph and the manger, we get all of that from Luke because Luke didn't just write about what he personally witnessed. He went and he sat down with someone like Mary and said, tell me what happened. And so you get all this kind of looking back detail from Luke. It's, it's an amazing read. Um, what else? What else? Uh, Acts spans 30 years. From AD 33, when Jesus rose from the dead, until AD 72, you're going to leave in the last chapter. is going to be, Paul is going to be in house arrest in Rome. And it spans that whole 30 years. Luke doesn't tell you every single thing that happened in the early church. He hits the high points so that you understand how the church was formed and how it expanded across the ancient world. Anything else that I really need to tell you? No, let's go into verse three. During the 40 days after Jesus suffered and died... He appeared to the apostles from time to time. That's the 12 apostles, the disciples. And Jesus proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. Say actually alive. They needed those proofs, right? Because the guy had been dead before. Have you known anybody who was dead and is now alive? That's kind of a unique experience. So they needed a lot of meetings with Jesus. They needed a lot of different proofs that he was actually alive. And so Jesus was present with them for 40 days, it says. It's like five and a half weeks, right? Did I do the math right? It's like five and a half weeks. I mean, that's a lot of time. Like it's a lot of time for Jesus to meet with them multiple times, for them to hear a lot of different teaching from Jesus, for Jesus to go back to the Old Testament prophecies and say, here's how I actually fulfilled these prophecies. When I died on the cross, here's actually what it meant. When I rose from the dead, here's actually what it meant. Because these disciples start writing literature into the New Testament. And you're like, how did they know all of this stuff? Because Jesus taught them. Jesus explained. He had 40 days to do it. And he had 40 days to show himself to a lot of different people. In the book of 1 Corinthians, it says that at one point, Jesus, not only did he appear to a lot of different people during that 40 days, but at one point, he appeared to more than 500 believers all at once. And I think that scene may be in just a moment that we're just about to read. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the father sends you the gift that he promised. That gift is the Holy Spirit. Verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the church begins as a Jewish religion inside of Jerusalem. And then throughout the book of Acts, missionaries are going to take the message of Jesus out, 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 just like he tells them to do here. And it's finally going to land in the center of the Gentile empire, Rome. And that's going to be symbolic for us as a fulfillment of what Jesus asked them to do. So it's massive. Verse nine, after saying this, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. Jesus levitates, amen? Just, just a little detail. And they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, which by the way, if you loved Jesus as much as they did, if Jesus was starting to leave you, you would strain to see the last few moments that you had with him. Two white robed men suddenly stood among them. These are angels. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in, in the same way you saw him go. In the same way you saw him go. That's a really important phrase. The angels are saying Jesus is going to return. Anybody happy about that? Do you ever get weary with this life? Do you ever get weary with this broken, dark world? Do you ever want something better? I do. Um, sometimes what I really want better is I really want a better me. 
I want a me that is not bound to the sinful nature that I've still got going on inside of me. I want to be free from that finally, not just forgiven, but totally free in heaven, leaving all of that old version of me behind. Can I get an amen? I want to leave all of that behind, and I long to see Jesus face to face. And so they say, he's going to come back, but when he comes back, he's going to come back in the same way that you saw him go. So if he went up into the clouds, he's going to come back from the clouds, yes? If he went up in person physically, he's not going to come back as a vapor or as a symbol or as an idea. He's actually going to come back as a physical person. Some scholars even think that because this took place at the Mount of Olives as a geographical location, that the second coming of Jesus will first have him setting foot on the Mount of Olives. I don't know if that's true, but it's fun to think about. Verse 12. Then the apostles, after the ascension, they returned to Jerusalem. And during this time, when about, uh, during this time, when about 100 believers were together in one place, notice the numbers again. Dr. Luke likes to give us numbers, yes? He gave us 40 days. He, he's giving us 120 believers right now. Peter stood up and addressed them. This is the apostle Peter. He's standing up as the leader of the church, and he's making a speech to the people that are gathered there. Brothers, he said, the scripture had to be fulfilled concerning Judas. Do you remember him? He's the one who betrayed the Lord, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David, he says. Um, Now, what we're about to read next is graphic. Um, It's difficult. It's gruesome. And it involves suicide. Here is your trigger warning. Let's keep reading. Verse 18, Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. That word treachery there, does that sound emotional to you? Absolutely. Falling head first there, his body split open, spilling out all of his intestines. Again, very gruesome. You can almost hear a doctor describing this to you. The news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name, Akeldama, which means field of blood. There's a lot going on there. What we're about to keep reading into is Peter is going to say, we've got to replace Judas, and I'll deal with that in just a minute. But before we go any further, I want to deal with this topic of suicide um, because it's, it's a very deep one for us. Um, Now, there's a lot going on with a character named Judas, and if you're not familiar with him and you're not familiar with how he fits into the story, let me just say this. Um, Judas was one of the 12. He had followed Jesus in all of his travels. He He was a trusted member of the inner 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. He knew Jesus. He had access to Jesus. He was trusted And at one moment, he decides to betray Jesus, and he goes and he takes a bribe, and he decides to lead some soldiers to Jesus in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane because Judas had such inner knowledge of Jesus' patterns, he knew he would be there praying. And he leads soldiers there to arrest Jesus. He gives him the, the betrayal kiss to indicate which person in that crowd. So all the soldiers knew exactly who they were arresting. They arrest Jesus. Jesus is eventually killed. There's a a moment in Judas's own history where um, once he realizes that his actions, his betrayal leads actually to the death of Jesus, he is so filled with remorse and despair uh, that he gives the money back. And then he goes and the gospel of Matthew says he hanged himself. And Luke gives us some other additional detail about uh, somehow he was on some kind of apparatus and maybe fell. And and as he fell, um, that's where he really died as he fell against rock or stone or, or whatever it was. We don't know exactly what took place there. We just know Luke had additional detail by this time that he was writing this, and so he gives it to us. But the reason I want to spend just a little bit of time on it is because down through church history, 
a false teaching emerged that says that anybody who takes their life by suicide has a one-way ticket to hell. That is wrong. That is not biblical. And I just want to, I guess, just pull back the veil a little bit on, on maybe how some of that stuff had happened. And, and, and again, if you know the story of Judas, you, could, you can imagine for the first few centuries of church life, that guy was a bit of a villain to them. They didn't like him. They didn't like his memory. And this guy that they very much did not like, they get some indications, some things that Jesus said. He might have gone to hell, maybe. I don't even think that's conclusive, personally. But suicide was wrapped up in that. And at some point, all those negative feelings in church people started to associate suicide and hell. And that became something that got really complex and very destructive, in my personal opinion. As a pastor, I have preached funerals for people who took their own life. I have sought to comfort family members. And that old wrong teaching in the church, that's not neutral, by the way. It's damaging. It's unbiblical and it's damaging. Um, I, I, and I've talked about her before. I knew, knew one lady who was a wonderful Bible study leader. She was a wonderful counselor of battered women. But man, she had a brain chemical makeup that you don't understand. And she wrestled with depression in a way most of us in this room don't understand. And she absolutely loved Jesus Christ and had amazing knowledge of his word, amazing character, and an amazing ministry. And then every once in a while, that darkness would just take over. And she one day gave in to that. And I preached her funeral. And I read poetry to Jesus that she had written herself. Beautiful sister that I will see in heaven someday and can't wait to see her again. Okay, we'll keep moving. Suicide does not send you to hell. And gosh, and there's even people that are like, Pastor, I don't know that you should say that because then, then people will go, hmm, guys, God does not come and threaten those of us that struggle with that temptation. He does not threaten us with hell as a way to stop us from doing it. And I know there's risk to say that. There is always, for a pastor, always risk to pushing grace that people will sin all the more. I'll take that risk. Okay. Acts 1, 21. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas, Peter says. From among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus, from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us, whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. Peter wants a replacement. He says, we got an empty ch chair on the leadership team. And that's kind of weird, by the way. It's kind of weird that he feels a need to do this. The only thing I can, I can imagine is that Peter is remembering a verse, and I'm not going to put it on your screens, but it's Matthew 1928, if you're taking notes. But there's this little moment where Jesus says, at some point, he's talking to the disciples. He says, at some point in the future, you 12 disciples are going to sit on 12 thrones and you're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus does this thing where he imagines the old people of God in the Old Testament are broken into these 12 tribes of Israel and they're going to come up to the new people of God represented by the 12 apostles. And so you've got the old people of God represented by 12 leaders, the new people of God represented by 12 leaders. And that idea even gets picked up in Revelation in the symbolism of the new Jerusalem. If you want to study that, I think Peter felt that and said, we've got to replace that 12th chair. And so they do. Cool? I know that's a lot. And they're about to choose his replacement in three ways. The very first way that they're looking at is wisdom, is wisdom. If you're going to replace Judas, we need somebody who was with Jesus face to face for three years. Just like the rest of us got mentored by Jesus, he needs to be mentored by Jesus. Does that make sense? And they saw his resurrection. The next thing they're going to do in verse 24, then they all prayed. Oh Lord, you know every heart. 
show us which of these men you have chosen. So that's step two. So first step is they exercise wisdom. Step two is they exercise prayer. Then the third one is they cast lots. And Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. They cast lots. If you're unfamiliar with the phrase cast lots, the closest thing I can give you in modern times is they rolled the dice. Scale of one to 10, weirdness. That's a 10, amen? That's a 10. Um, look at Proverbs 16:33. Um, we may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. I know, it's not less weird, is it? It's still weird. Um, yeah, what do we do with this? Um, this is a concept throughout the Old Testament. It's the best way I would describe it. Um, God is coming in saying that he is just this sovereign. He is just this in control of what goes on in the world that when you use an instrument to determine his will, God will often act. The Lord determines how they fall. Now the caveat besides weirdness, the caveat that I will give to that in the Old Testament is that even when you look at devices like the Urim and the Thummim, if you're a Bible student, the high priests use this in the Old Testament law they would have a device that would go on the high priest's ephod and they would blindfold themselves and go and they, they would select a device off of that that would tell them the Lord's answer. But they always had an option that said, God is not answering us today. If you read that closely, there are many times where we'll say they consulted the Urim and the Thummim and God did not answer them. So if you're gonna try to do this in your own life, which I do not recommend, by the way, you don't get to flip a coin because that's only got a yes and a no, right? You've got to have an option there that where God gets to say, I'm not doing this thing with you today. I told you it wouldn't get less weird than it already was. Um, I'll tell you this. They do that there. There'd have been a lot of precedent in the, in the Old Testament for doing that. Um, they wrapped it in prayer. I'll tell you that. So their submission to the Lord was clear. God honored it very clearly. Um, you never see the casting of lots show up again in the New Testament. And at Grace Fellowship, we do not roll dice to see who the next church elders are. <laughs> Just to be clear. Or the next life group leaders or the next head ushers or anything like that. There are lots of different ways that you can hear God and we seldom use that way. It's still weird. I know it's still weird. Okay, here's where I want to land us on that weird verse. They cast lots. We just read a verse where early church leaders who are wonderful people, can I get an amen on that? This is the apostle Peter for heaven's sake. And he cast lots. The question that should emerge for us is, is what he just did there something that I'm supposed to also do? The pattern that the early church did, am I supposed to do that same pattern in my modern life? And again, I've been strongly indicating to you here, the answer is probably no. But how did you get there? How do we get there? How do we interpret verses like this? Verses that give us the history and sometimes, and, and, and some of you guys have been dealing with this a long time, you know it's true. Sometimes the church has overread parts of scripture and they've brought a pattern out of scripture that just because they did it, the modern church has got to do it as well. It's a big deal. And we've got to drive into that. It's a, it's a thing that the theologians call the clarity of scripture. It's, the, it's the, the test that they call prescriptive versus descriptive. And we're going to get into all of that for just a few minutes here because this is all over the book of Acts. If we're going to do Acts together as a church, I feel like this is a tool that you need on your tool belt. If you're going to track with us through this thing, I need you to have this so that you can read the Bible well. Okay, sometimes the way people approach you is like, just trust your pastor. Nope, don't just trust your pastor. You're supposed to read the scripture and know it 
for you. And there's some lies that are out there that sometimes I think we are led to believe that we are personally hopeless to understand God's word and you are not hopeless to understand God's word. Or that only scholars even can. That's not true. Or, or we talked about denominations last, last, uh, uh, last year, um, several months ago. And it's like, and there's all these divisions based on people's interpretations of what the scripture says. And I think sometimes it's tempting to just throw up our hands and say, well, I guess it's just all mystery. No. Those divisions took place most, mostly for the wrong reasons. And often when people come to different conclusions on God's word, they didn't have to. And that's a, that's a very, very big, broad study on scriptural interpretation. And you're not going to get your PhD today. But I want to give you one tool. 2 Timothy 2.15. We are capable of understanding our Bible. Do your best, this is Paul talking, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker, say worker, a worker. That means this might be work for you, amen? amen. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. What this verse is telling us is that God built his Bible with you being able to access it in mind. A lot of times we make a big deal about the fact that God's word is true. God's word is right, right? All scripture is God breathed. It is perfect for us. And that's all true. But God also breathed his word in such a way that it is within reach for you. This is your Bible. You don't have to be a pastor or a theologian. The systematic theology people call this the clarity of scripture. The scripture is clear enough that you can read it for yourself. Uh, when I was growing up and it'd be Christmas or some big family event, you get 20 to 30 of my extended family jammed into somebody's first floor of their house. Um, there had to be a, a little kid table that I was thrust to. Anybody else here experience that? So there's the adult table and then there's the kid table. Anybody like the kid table? Probably not. Sometimes the adults would say things like, be quiet, the adults are talking. Was that an enjoyable thing to hear? No, right? Because what were they doing? They were, <laughs> they were shutting you out. And they were limiting you. They were speaking limitation over you. Um, that's not fun. Sometimes you've had the experience with scripture and sometimes with hearing pastors deliver scripture to you where the way that they did it, you felt like you were in the little kid table. And you're not to question. And either I won't explain, I won't take your criticisms or your questions, or I'm just gonna drum up so, so much uh, magical preaching ability at you that we're just gonna gloss over some of my conclusions so that you don't see what I just did there. Ooh little kid table, 2 Peter 3.15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom that was given to him. This is the apostle Peter talking about the letters that the apostle Paul was writing in the New Testament. As he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them on these matters, speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand. Have you ever read the book of Romans before? Some of it's hard to understand. Amen. So he acknowledges that. He says, which it, the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So he says, hey, I know sometimes it is tough. Not every single verse is as easy to understand as every other verse. Some of them are tough and they take some work, but also you can twist them. Don't twist them. Verse 17, you therefore beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care. Say take care. Take, take care. care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability so Peter says, yeah, it might be tough sometimes, but it's still clear to you. And if you faithfully approach God's word and you read it, 
and you bring the Holy Spirit that is inside of you. Did you know the Holy Spirit is inside of you? If you are in Christ, you have the interpreter of scripture himself inside of you. And then if you come with the right heart and the right motive, God will speak to you. And you don't have to be afraid of it. And you don't have to wait for a scholar or somebody with a seminary degree to come along and make it okay. You are not at the kid table. Take care. Okay, so descriptive versus prescriptive. Let's dive into this. Okay, Peter rolls the dice. Descriptive or prescriptive. This might sound obvious, but it's really, really helpful. This is the tool. Descriptive simply tells us what the history is. This is the history. If it's prescriptive, that means it's a command. Descriptive just describes it. Prescriptive is like a doctor who says, this is what I'm prescribing to you. You ought to do this. You must do this. That's prescriptive. It's a command. Descriptive, it happened. Prescriptive means it should always happen. They did this or we must do this. So the casting of lots is descriptive. Don't take something that's descriptive and make it prescriptive. Don't turn things into a command. For instance, um, Goliath, the giant, was blaspheming God publicly. David came along with a sling and a stone and killed him and then sliced off his head. The next time you run into somebody who's blaspheming God publicly, do you do likewise? No. No. No, right? Like the point of the story and that being in your Bible is not to prescribe to you that you should do exactly what David did. Now you might be able to lift a principle off of that and say, there's something about trusting God and God comes through. Yeah, there might be a principle like that, but you're not supposed to take that as a pattern and say, therefore I must get myself a sling. Moses parts the Red Sea. Beautiful moment. The next time you find an impassable body of water. (laughs) Get on maps and find yourself a bridge, amen? Amen. Like, that's okay. (laughs) Jesus walked on water. You you know what I'm saying. Gideon put out a wool fleece. Some of you guys might know this story. It's in the Old Testament. This guy Gideon, he's a general and like God tells him to go fight this army and he kind of doesn't want to. And so he, he does this thing where he's like, God, did you really speak? Are you sure? And, and, and so he says, God, if you really spoke, here's what I want you to do. I've got this wool fleece, which is like a wool blanket I'm going to put on the ground. And when I wake up tomorrow morning, I want the ground all around that blanket to be dry and I want the blanket itself to be wet. And that means that you spoke to me. So he woke up the next morning and it happened. And then he's like, well, I'm still not settled, so I want it to flip tomorrow. So he woke up the next day, and God flipped it exactly like he asked him to. So Gideon's like, okay, I guess I'll go. (laughs) Descriptive or prescriptive? It's descriptive. But Christians will walk around all the time and say, well, you ought to put out a fleece. (laughs) No. No, don't get yourself a wool blanket, and now all of a sudden you're going to hear God. Oh, that's complex. And it's like, and there are ways that sometimes God will speak. Sometimes God will bless that, but you don't have to treat it like it's a command. And you don't have to treat it like it's a 100% guarantee because it's descriptive. It's not prescriptive. So now let's get into the book of Acts because this is this 28 chapters. We're going to do this together. There's so many spots where it's like, and you might even be like really nervous already that we're even preaching Acts because you know what the church you came from did with this book. Some of your churches were really comfy with it and some were not so comfy. But in the book of Acts, the early church, they celebrated the Lord's Supper or communion weekly. Does that mean it's a law that you have to take communion every single week? No, it's not. It's a description of the history of what they did. You might want to look at that and say, but I do think maybe there's a principle there that it ought to be regular. Yes, for sure. But be careful that you don't turn it into a command. Um, The churches often met in homes in the book of Acts. Does that mean every church must meet in a home? No, although there can be some value to that. So be careful how you understand those things. Do you see how you have a brain? And you're able to read God's word 
and like be logical and realistic about it. This again, this isn't rocket science. We've just got to be careful. There's a there's there there are churches that that believe that you cannot use musical instruments on Sunday morning. And how they got there is because there is no reference to musical instruments being used in the New Testament for church worship, even though instruments are all over the book of Psalms and used in praising God in a congregation. But they take that absence of the example in the New Testament and say, therefore, we cannot because I don't see it there. So that's, a, that's an even weird version of descriptive. That's, it's not described, therefore it's a command. And that's a really big leap to take. Therefore, you must not have air conditioning at your church or parking lots or sound systems because none of those things are described in the New Testament. And I'm not saying that to mock anybody. I'm really not. There are wonderful people in those churches. I'm just saying you have the ability to read your Bible. You are not hopeless. That's the point. I was told when I was growing up, you should never drink alcohol. You know, the closest thing I can find to that is what's called the Nazarite vow in the Old Testament, and they didn't drink alcohol. And then some people come along and they're afraid that if people take their first drink of alcohol, they'll become an alcoholic. And so they twist the Bible around to say no one should ever drink alcohol, but that is not what it says. It says don't get drunk with alcohol. But don't go too far, right? Like, like sometimes we'll take something that the Bible says and you're like, I don't think God knew what he was doing. <laughs> like, I need to take what he said and add my own sauce to it, right? <laughs> like, that's what I need to do. Like, like I, was, <laughs> I was told growing up, don't ever go to a rated R movie. That's not in the Bible. Oh, that's weird, Right? You know what the Bible says? It says, never think lustfully about another person that's not your spouse. Otherwise, it's okay. <laughs> but you're not supposed to do that. So I had some, some really well-meaning, wonderful man of God who looked at that verse and in the midst of his own struggles and his own journey, he concluded that because some of the content of a rated R movie might drive him to lust, he turned it into a rule. He turned it into a legalistic command of God, even though it wasn't in there. And I share that little example because sometimes we feel justified. Sometimes we feel like God's not going to mind if I do it this time. Yes, he will. Don't go down that road. You, you doing okay? This is heady stuff. Are we all right? Okay. I just, again, I, this is a tool I want you to have on your tool belt. I feel like you need this. Um, so test it. So test it. Is it commanded somewhere else? And test me as your pastor when I preach to you. If I share a narrative or history with you and say, this is what the people of God did, I don't get to say, therefore, you must do the same thing. If, if I want to do that, I better darn well give you a verse somewhere else in the New Testament that says, and it's commanded. Then I'm okay, right? But I can't just give you that and you guys be Bereans and some of you guys know what that means. We're gonna look at that later, but feel free to test that. That's what needs to be done. The second thing is, is maybe it's not a command. Maybe it's a helpful principle. Like there's a lot of things that aren't commands in scripture that are still extremely helpful for us to read and know, yes? Like one example of this is like when Jesus sent the disciples out to preach, he sent them two by two, he sent them in pairs. Doesn't that make sense? So that they could support each other, right? So they could support each other, they could hold each other accountable, they could celebrate each other's wins. He sent them out two by two, not alone. I love that. And then you come into the book of Acts and you'll see Paul and Silas together and Paul and Barnabas together and John and, and um, John and Peter, John and Peter together. And you see the kind of two by two thing go, go forth. So it's like, I can look at that and say, boy, that makes a lot of sense for church leadership. Maybe we shouldn't be lone rangers, yes? But I can't turn it into a command. Be careful. Okay, Deuteronomy 4.2. We don't get to add commands that aren't there. Do not add or subtract from these commands I am giving you. This is Moses in the Old Testament. Just obey the commands of the Lord, your God, that I am giving to you. He says the Bible is hard enough. You don't get to add stuff. And don't take stuff away either. 
but you don't get to add. And then Jesus comes along to people who had added, and, and these are the teachers of the law and Pharisees is who he's referencing here. He says, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and they never lift a finger to ease the burden. Sometimes we want to be so hardcore, don't we? And we look at the scripture and it's like, I'll just take this a little bit further because I'm so hardcore. Don't do that. You stick to what God has revealed. And that's a better place to be. Last verse. The word is near. Love this passage. It's one of my favorites, all-time favorites. It's Moses talking. He says, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. It is not in heaven. It's not, it's not so far above you, you can't reach it, right? That you should say, who will send to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea. It's so far away that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Instead, the word is very near you. It's within arm's reach. You're not at the kid table. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so that you can do it. To me, this is God's love for us. Would you guys stand? You're not shut out today. It might, it might require a little bit of work on your part, for sure. But God has equipped you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that as we go into the book of Acts, Lord, and we, we're going to see all these controversial places and verses and stuff. Lord, you, you will reward study. You will reward the discussion that we have with friends, trying to figure these things out. God, you'll speak. Lord, help us to believe you today. The word is near. The word is near. In Christ's name, amen.